destroyed or devalued in the, in the recessions. Well, what happens when between the recessions there's a recovery? Well, this is what happens. Real output per worker, or you could do it per hour, uh, continues to go up. And look at this. The slope of this uh, diagram from 2000 through 2010 is sharper uh, than it was back in the boom days of the post-war era of capitalism and so forth. So what I'm saying is that productivity, that's that quote from the Grundrisse, it's also in capital, uh, <coughs> does destroy uh, industrial manufacturing jobs. And here's the other outcome of this period. The productivity, and this is the more conventional me uh, measure, goes up. But hourly compensation, not just wages, but benefits as well, stays flat. And, you know, the, the little figure here, 113% rise, all of that took place before 1980. Mm -hmm. Almost none of it since. Uh, this is, you want to know where inequality comes from, this is the root. There are other factors, of course, but this is the root of it. Uh, the rise in surplus value uh, in, in manufacturing. As a result, profit rates recover, not to their highest level, previous level, but they recover nonetheless, as is historically true, uh, ups and downs. Um, but the increase in surplus value makes that happen. Well, okay, the neoliberal era arrives in the early 80s or late 70s, depending on how you want to look at it, <clears throat> uh, and it's incredibly disorienting towards the working class, towards the trade union leadership, towards much of the trade union membership, for that matter. Outsourcing conglomerate corporations from the last wave of uh, mergers in the 60s and 70s, lean production, which is what is behind a lot of this productivity. I don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, and what I call post-lean production, that is the more recent introduction of biometric and electronic measuring and monitoring and so forth. Uh, <coughs> long supply chains, pre-logistics revolution, offshoring. All these things were incredibly disorienting, which explains not the whole story, but part of the story about why the unions have uh, collapsed in this period. But something else is going on. Capitalism is never repeating itself exactly. Uh, <clears throat> the crisis, in, in a certain sense, the falling rate of profit in a long-term sense, uh, <clears throat> creates some new things. Now, this, these are mergers and acquisitions. Back here, turn of the century, uh, the 1920s, big merger movements laid the basis for many of the big corporations that the CIO organized. Not the only factor, but it was a factor. Industrial rationality. Uh, okay, conglomeration later. Now, the highest level of merger, mergers uh, ever, uh, and by the way, it's, this only goes so far, but I'll show you something else in a minute. Uh, and this merger movement is different. The conglomerates are gone. People are shedding things. Um, again, in, in a minute, I'll show you some of that. Uh, <clears throat> and these mergers are along industrial product or market lines which I think is much more favorable for workers and for unionization and so forth uh, as a source of possible po power. But of course, not only that, the companies we're dealing with are bigger, uh, which sounds like that might be bad, but I would argue that it means actually the workers, if they use the power, if they're organized properly to do that, uh, will have more power, not less. Here's the more recent course of these mergers and act acquisitions uh, and along the so-called core competencies. Here are some of the things. Uh, an interesting thing 
GE, GM, and Chrysler shed their financial units. We're always hearing, well, you know, these companies depend on their financial unit. No, uh, they got rid of them because they were in the way of competing in the line of their major line of production. And that's an important thing. Behind all these things I'm talking about, of course, is what Amarche calls real capitalist competition, vicious, warlike competition. I'm not going to go through all of these things, but what you can see here is that more and bigger companies are concentrating huge numbers of workers, market shares. Uh, by the way, the falling rate of profit uh, is one of the forces behind the mergers. Uh, if your profit rate is falling and you don't want to spend a lot on investment, what do you do? You gobble up the competition. Uh, you get more market share and you get their surplus value. So your massive profits goes up even if you haven't overcome the, uh, the basic underlying problem. Here's something else. The result of these trends uh, and others is that the concentration of capital per worker has gone up despite all the slowing down of investment and everything else. Uh, and again, I'm, I'll show you an argument for why that is a good thing. Even though Marx says, of course, you know, the greater the concentration uh, of capital be your wages high or low, the worse your life will be. Uh, <clears throat> another counterintuitive thing I ran across that actually surprised me is that outside of manufacturing, more people work in large workplaces than before. Uh, <clears throat> approximately 8 million more work in uh, places of 500 or more, and 6 million of those in places with 1,000 workers or more. So the idea that all the workplaces become these tiny little places and we're all at home behind a computer and all this stuff is, for the most part, not the case. <clears throat> Here's what Shape says about the relation of capital intensity uh, and fixed costs, which go along with this, uh, that in fact this creates more power and leverage uh, for workers, not less. All right, here's the other side of the big change. On the one hand, consolidation of industries. On the other hand, the logistics revolution. This is something that while some of the uh, techniques that make it are, are quite old, containerization, uh, intermodal transport, etc., as a complete, forget the word, gestalt or something, uh, it's actually quite new. Um, I would say less than 20 years, maybe approximately 20 years. Uh, these are streamlined supply chains with fewer suppliers on average in most industries connected digitally and, and tracked uh, digitally on a just-in-time basis, as we know, which makes the whole thing, uh, you know, much more uh, <coughs> vulnerable, as I'll talk about a little more in a minute. Um, well, here. Vulnerable corridors. Generally, when the experts on this thing are talking about it, there's, you know, uh, connections of various types, corridors and nodes. Uh, corridors, of course, are the modes of transport. Uh, and you can see, or uh, we know, that these are incredibly vulnerable to strike action, or almost any kind of action. Ports, parks, and modern warehouses. That's really uh, an important thing, the warehouse. This is a growing, uh, the, the whole logistics thing, growing sector of the workforce, uh, not a shrinking one. And <clears throat> these nodes, the ports, the parks, the warehouse, these are points of vulnerability uh, in, in the system. Uh, mostly they're not used. Sometimes they are, like West Coast Longshore people a few years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and there are other examples, but mostly organized labor 
about logistics, we're not just talking about producer to producer supply chains or producer to retail. We're also talking about producer to every service you can think about. No hospital, no school, no hotel, on and on, can run without the supply chains that are part of this set. And here, well, I won't dwell on this, but, you know, the, the density of the interstate system in the Midwest is somewhat important strategically. Interestingly enough, we all hear about our decaying infrastructure, right? And it is. Yet, billions have been spent on upgrading the major rail corridors across the country uh, so they can do double stacked uh, trains and so forth. Um, also, speaking of concentration, there are five railroads that own the whole thing. <clears throat> All right. Logistics clusters. This, I think, to me, is the most interesting part of all of this. Uh, capital always makes mistakes, right? Uh, they made a mistake a long time ago when they put all these factories in Detroit or Gary or Pittsburgh or whatever. Akron. Akron, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, then they got rid of those, supposedly. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> now, in order to, to link together the, the supply chains that are more typical of manufacturing and the movement of uh, goods, they've created these clusters. There are 60 of them in the United States, more or less. What's interesting about them is that they not only all together employ about 3.5 million workers, probably actually much more than that, uh, <clears throat> but that the major ones like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Memphis, employ, generally speaking, in excess of 100,000 workers in a finite geographic area. So Memphis, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, Port, Los Angeles, Port, etc. These are today's Detroit's. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to argue that these workers are production workers. They produce value, volume two of capital. Uh, <clears throat> and not only the, the truckers and the rail and the air people, but the warehouse workers. Because a warehouse these days is not some multi-story brick thing in Brooklyn with luxury apartments. You know, it's that thing you saw on the first uh, first slide. Uh, they're gigantic, they're high-tech, and they employ lots of people. Uh, <clears throat> and products move through them. They're there to transship, not to store. So they too are producing value, interestingly enough, on imports as well as domestically uh, produced products. So they have a, a good deal of power over this whole movement of goods throughout the entire economy, uh, and they're concentrated together. Importantly, they, these clusters are next to major urban areas, and they draw on this reserve army of labor that people are talking about, the surplus population, are, are the people who are being drawn particularly into the warehouses uh, at low wages, precarious work, the whole thing. Uh, but they have potentially, again, it's all potential, uh, they have potentially a great deal of power. So, okay, service jobs. Um, I'm going to run out of time, I think. So, <clears throat> what do I have about, oh, sure, you have four minutes? About five. Okay. Okay, service jobs. Sorry about that. As I mentioned before, uh, today's service jobs are, the, the growth in them are composed particularly of two groups. Those engaged in the commodified labor of social reproduction, which is absolutely key to the development of society. Uh, they actually have a lot of power. Here are the nurses on strike. Nurses strike more than anybody else, even teachers. Uh, <clears throat> and they have a lot of power. They win their strikes, and they win them fast. Uh, <clears throat> so that's important. Janitors. Well, these people can't have any power. Yeah, try to run a high-rise office building for more than two or three days without having it cleaned. You can't do it. So potentially they have a lot of power. Sometimes 
it's used by this union, which isn't my favorite one, but nonetheless, <laughs> sometimes it's used and sometimes it isn't. Well, the union is not the question, the leadership is the question. Uh, <clears throat> and the maintenance and repair, uh, of which the janitors are one particular part, uh, of Apple's mixed assets. Again, not just plant equipment, but the whole built environment of, of capital structure, uh, including those office buildings and hospitals, etc. Um, I was going to talk about the theory of the next upsurge, what makes an upsurge and all of that. Instead, I'm going to end with what I ended with on a Friday night, <clears throat> and that is to make what I think is an important point about uh, these big changes that, that have taken place and the weakness and disorientation of not only organized labor but of workers in many ways. Uh, when these big changes come along in capitalism, as they always do, the growth of the factory system, the rise of mass production and Taylorism, the uh, acceleration of the speed up of the 1950s, uh, and so on, it takes the working class and its activist layer, and certainly its leaders, a while to figure out where are the weak points in this new setup. How do we deal with this? Uh, <clears throat> you know, the old organizations, the old tactics don't seem to work anymore. We're losing members. It's all falling apart. Uh, we need to think analytically, strategically, tactically about how to deal with this new situation. And so eventually they do, and the results are uneven. You can get a CIO, which is pretty big, or you can get the weaker rank-and-file rebellions of the 60s and 70s, uh, which didn't change that much. <clears throat> but the, the response comes. So what I'm saying is that uh, given that these changes taken together as a whole are really only about two decades old, <clears throat> that we're looking at uh, what isn't even a generation's length of experience with this? Uh, that it takes time for people to experiment. And I think we see experiments uh, in different ways of doing strikes and different tactics and so on and so forth. Not all working by any means, but they, they are uh, experimenting with these things. And I think also an interesting thing, what I'm saying here is that, you know, Perhaps in a few years we can expect people will have learned more. We can't be sure of that. We can't predict it. But, you know, it's, it's not uh, out of the realm of reality. Uh, one just final little point, speaking of experiments. In the last few years in this country, for the first time since May 1st, 1886, people are using the strike weapon for broad social and political goals. Gender equality with the women's strike, immigrant rights on February 16th and certainly May 1st coming up, uh, 2006, uh, the fight for 15 things. I know that these strikes are not always perfect and all the rest of it, but this is quite a development if you think about it. Uh, <coughs> nobody, uh, no Union leadership certainly came up with the idea that people should go out in their tens and perhaps even hundreds of thousands to strike for their rights uh, rather than just a collective bargaining strike, and yet it's happening. So sometimes people learn from these kind of experiments, and that's uh, one of the hopes we have. Let me just conclude by saying if there's going to be an upsurge, the thing to do is not to wait for it, the thing to do is organize and prepare for it. Thanks. Go ahead, Nikki. I'm just going to play with this one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kim and Charlie, for inviting me on the panel. Um, I want to talk a little bit about jobs. Uh, I usually talk about investment, but I'm talking about jobs and investment, of course. But 
I want to talk about jobs. The title of my talk is called Bad Jobs Everywhere, uh, Lessons from the U.S. Auto Industry. So in the interest of being pedantic, I'll talk about my title for a second. Um, so we live in capitalism, so you might wonder if it's not a bit redundant uh, to comment on the seeming ubiquity of bad jobs. Uh, in many respects, there are no good jobs in capitalism, right? We all work, uh, but the vast majority of people work for businesses who steal the value of their sweat, doggedness, and creativity, and in return provide a paycheck and a place to go every day, and that's it if you're lucky. Um, but I think we can agree that even in capitalism, some jobs are better than others. Uh, and they can be better for a variety of reasons. Maybe they might offer the worker status, um, a respect. They might be relatively easy. Uh, or most importantly, they might pay pretty well, uh, giving you the opportunity to support an expensive mountain biking habit uh, or something else like that. Um, the auto industry, I think, is interesting. It provides an interesting way to think about bad jobs and less bad jobs, if we want to talk about it that way. Uh, historically, auto jobs have been classified as both bad and good jobs. So in the beginning, uh, they were just bad, right? Dangerous, dirty, precarious, disrespected, grueling, poorly paid. You can add some other adjectives if you want. Uh, but over time, uh, they got a little bit better. Granted, they remained dirty, dangerous, and grueling. Uh, for, in Canada, for example, female uh, parts workers are fighting a long fight to try to get uh, official recognition that their jobs gave them cancer. Uh, they work in the plastics industry. Um, but by the post-World War II period, auto jobs began to get better, particularly unionized auto jobs. Uh, the UAW and other smaller unions active in the component sector used their collective power to demand higher pay, health and pension benefits, and various workplace rights that did things like give older workers who had toiled for decades in the line slightly easier jobs as they neared retirement. The gains were tangible, right? They turned terrible jobs into something slightly better, and the gains seemed lasting, right? For a moment, it seemed like maybe we had tamed the beast. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that uh, we hadn't. Um, and the conditions that had undergirded capital's sort of apparent quiescence, uh, high profits, dampened competition, uh, powerful unions proved unsustainable. That's a long, interesting story that we can talk about another day. Uh, but I want to just kind of jump forward to the present um, and think about the auto industry. So today, the good elements of auto jobs are largely gone. Uh, and the UAW uh, is a shadow of its former self. We can all agree on that. Uh, the union, the industry, the auto industry's union density has slipped below 20%, which is certainly higher than the private sector. Um, but in 1985, just to give you a sense, roughly 60% of U.S. auto workers were unionized. Uh, by the mid-90s, that had dropped to about 44%, uh, reach, and it reached down to about 29% in 2005. Today, about 81% of the auto industry is non-union. Um, and if we think about just in terms of working, right, in the union, uh, many auto workers, including those who remain in a union, struggle, struggle to make a living wage. Uh, the UAW agreed to expand and standardize tiered wages in its 2007 agreement with the Detroit Three. And during the financial crisis, uh, the Treasury Department demanded uh, that it loosen the terms even further, raising its cap on the number of workers who get cut rate pay and increasing the number of flex workers, temporary workers, <coughs> and workers on temporary assignment all of whom uh, in effect, in effect uh, are third tier. We also have alternative work schedules, which are alternating day, night, weekday, weekend shifts that wreak havoc on sleep cycles, parenting duties, and overall quality of life. These have become normalized. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, we see enormous workloads, worsening health and safety conditions. Basically, all of this has made life for many auto workers uh, close to unbearable. And non-union auto workers, needless to say, are suffering even more. Um, Labor Notes had a really nice uh, graphic uh, a year or so ago showing uh, just sort of the breakdown of the industry. Non-union workers make about $16 an hour, uh, and there's a huge uh, divergence. Uh, at the top paid, you get Toyota, uh, workers at companies like Toyota, um, who are paid significantly more than workers at, say, Hyundai. Um, and non-union parts workers, many of them struggle to make a minimum wage, or they make barely more than minimum. 
And the waning strength of the UAW has meant that newer assembly plants in the U.S. South feel very little pressure to offer wages comparable uh, to the Detroit automakers. Now, there are a fractious few out there, and I've had many conversations with them, who argue that auto jobs are still better than a lot of jobs. They point out that <coughs> auto workers had a good run. Maybe many were able to send their kids to college and maybe buy a camper to dry up, drag up to the lake on the weekends. Uh, they argue that for workers working at companies like Target or driving for Uber, uh, you know, a chance to assemble a uh, Dodge Ram pickup would be a really great gig. Uh, that's fine, whatever. Uh, but I think there's an interesting element in this kind of whose job is the worst beauty pageant that uh, is, is on display, particularly in the mainstream media. Um, that these days, the auto jobs of yesteryear are being held up as the kind of gold standard for working people. And I think this was on display uh, in, in this past year's election as Trump promised to bring back uh, auto jobs. The neoliberal center didn't even bother talking about jobs except to make some vague noises about the problems with the gig economy. Uh, and I think this silence made Trump's promise seem louder and more real. And implicit in his promise, was the promise of not just a job, but a good job. And also implicit was the notion that the reason we don't have those jobs anymore is that they left, uh, that they packed up and went somewhere. So what did happen to those good jobs, right? Or less bad jobs? The auto industry looms large in the American psyche, so actually most people will have a definitive answer for you. Uh, and not just sort of average everyday people that you talk to, but experts, journalists, industry observers, finance types, they all weigh in and they don't necessarily agree on what happened to these uh, good jobs. One of the most popular explanations, and this is one that I've studied a lot, uh, for the loss of good jobs is globalization. When people say globalization destroyed the auto industry, they're referencing a popular narrative about how American car companies got fat, dumb, and lazy and started to make a crap product. In response, American consumers started buying foreign imports, and the competition heated up. The big three couldn't cut it, so they headed for cheaper shores as part of a cost-cutting strategy, along with focusing more heavily on light trucks and later SUVs and various other dubious restructuring strategies. The jobs that are left today, the story goes, could disappear at any moment, so if workers are smart, they won't make too many demands, or their next paycheck could be their last. And as Michael Burway and later uh, Kate Bronfenbrenner and Stephanie Luce have shown so clearly, threats to offshore production have been a persistent part of keeping uh, workers down since the 1980s at least. Uh, threats to close down the plant have proven extremely effective at squelching union drives, demands for better working conditions, or better contract at bargaining time. We saw this narrative play out recently actually when the UAW tried to organize the Volkswagen plant in Tennessee. Obviously, there were other plan problems with that organizing drive. I understand that, but whatever. We can talk about that in Q&A. Uh, <coughs> others point the finger at the loss of good jobs at the union. Uh, they say auto workers also got greedy and demanded more than companies could afford, especially with companies like Toyota and Volkswagen gunning for market share. And it isn't just business types uh, saying this. Auto experts and alleged allies like Sean McElindon and Harry Katz at Cornell and the Obama administration have all declared that U.S. auto workers simply make too much money, that they've been too successful at improving their terrible jobs, or at least what they're paid for them, for the market to bear. Those of a more left-wing persuasion argue that the, uh, UA, the International UAW Concessions Caucus, as Greg Shotwell puts it so nicely, is to blame, or should at least share in the blame equally. Uh, the union, we're told, sold out its members by siding with companies over other auto workers, uh, by standing by as parts workers were increasingly ejected from the fold. Today, only 22% of the industry is classified as assembly work. And later, for selling out younger workers, kicking them down to second and third tier jobs. Rank and filers often get lumped into this blame game when the subject of the environment comes up. People point to the opposition of the union to cash standards, for example. Uh, although this has changed in recent years, and Trump's recent decision to ax Obama's future emission standards, for example, is not supported by the UW. Uh, and still others blame the U.S. government uh, for the loss of bad jobs, for deciding that the easiest way to resolve its inability to provide both guns and butter, as the contradictions of the Bretton Woods model increased in the 1960s, was to squeeze working people. 
Uh, the state implemented free trade agreements like NAFTA, lined up alongside capital to demand givebacks from workers, allowed companies to use bankruptcy court to strip workers of their wages, benefits, and pensions, failed to implement basic workplace standards, the list goes on and on. And in the vein of Trump's rhetoric, uh, they point to, and certainly Trump is not the first person to say this, but we're talking about it more uh, these days, uh, they point to the skewed import-export stats for the United States compared to countries like Germany, Japan, Mexico, and South Korea to say the U.S. didn't do enough uh, to either protect this market and thereby its jobs uh, or to enter other markets, which would potentially create more jobs at home. All of these explanations are correct to some degree, but taken alone as they often are, they tend to create simplistic narratives that obscure as much as they reveal. This is particularly true in the case of, global, of the globalization explanation. It's true that globalization has destroyed the American-based manufacturing jobs of whole industries like apparel, footwear, much of the furniture industry, small electronics, and so on. But globalization has not hollowed out the U.S. auto industry. It's true that many jobs have moved to Mexico and U.S.-based assemblers are using an increasing number of components from China. And it is true that there are huge swaths of abandoned plant around the country, particularly in states like Michigan and Ohio. Job numbers have also declined. The industry today employs about 926,000 people in assembly and OEM part construction. That doesn't include dealers, aftermarket, all of those folks. Um, to give some perspective, in about two th the year 2000, this number was roughly 1.2 million. Uh, but in June 2009, the number had fallen to 623,000, uh, which was the mid-year of the auto crisis following the financial meltdown. Some of these jobs have been lost to globalization. Many have been eliminated through technological advances. Uh, but globalization has not just been responsible for destroying jobs. It, had also, it has also created hundreds of thousands of auto jobs in the United States over the past few decades both as a result of the economics of build where you sell production and regionalization, and also the political maneuvering of the Reagan administration and its import restraints on Japanese producers in the 1980s. Things have changed a lot to be sure. Okay, I'm not saying that it hasn't. It's not just business as usual. Uh, US auto workers produced roughly three out of four cars globally in 1950. Today they make a little more than one in 10 cars worldwide. But global production has increased dramatically. So after you smooth out the bumps, they make about the same number of cars they did uh, in, uh, in the decade after World War II. In the United States, uh, we've seen, particularly since the, the, the recovery from the financial crisis, we've seen massive investment uh, in US production by both foreign and domestic firms. Uh, last year, there were 17 and a half million cars sold in the United States. 70% of them, or about 12.2 million, were built here. Uh, and 40% of those were made by European or Asian companies. The point of all of this is to say that if we look at the kind of churning and changing since the financial crisis or even over the past 70 years of production, uh, we see that the industry is extremely cyclical. It's never up or down for long. It looks like it's about to go down. Um, and more importantly, that this kind of you know, landscape of perpetual creative de destruction, if we want to use that term, um, hasn't involved a straightforward kind of funneling of production out of the Midwest to the US, South, or Mexico. Uh, instead, and I didn't bring my slides, maybe I should have, uh, but if we look at the production, we can map it out and show that growth and decline has occurred simultaneously up and down the auto corridor. In fact, if you look at the remaining plants for the Detroit tree, Three, for example, most of them are still located in the Midwest. So deunionization, not deindustrialization, is the dominant process. <coughs> the point of this is not to say that companies haven't suffered immensely from this restructuring. They have. Their, structure, their suffering indicates how capital has determined the terms of this restructuring almost entirely, particularly in recent years. Moreover, if we're trying to figure out what happened to the decent jobs that used to support working class families, monocausal explanations, whether they focus on big processes like globalization or the bad choices of auto unions or the betrayal of democratic politicians, aren't particularly useful beyond a certain point. 
That said, the opposite of a monocausal explanation may veer toward a cop-out answer of, it's complicated, and that's not right either. The explanation for why there are no more good jobs in the auto industry is in many respects, respects quite straightforward. The class project that underpinned the gains of auto workers failed. And the ongoing failure of this class project, or we could call it the union project, uh, and this is important, has reverberated outwards, dragging down workers in every sector. Today, even university jobs and previously cushy gigs in the creative and professional sectors have been, to use the te technical term, suckified, and their precarization <laughs> is being propped up by an ocean <coughs> of shit jobs. So I think we're left holding onto a Polaroid of a good job. Working people look back and see those gold-plated gold -plated sweatshop gigs in auto plants as better days. I think the widespread appeal of Trump's easy promise to dump NAFTA and bring back infrastructure and manufacturing jobs demonstrate this nostalgia and desperation. I mean, there's a lot of really desperate people, who, and particularly since 2008, there have been a lot of jobs lost uh, uh, in, in the Midwest uh, auto companies. But the truth is, even if, and this is a big if, Trump kept his promise and did bring back those jobs, they wouldn't be good jobs because the conditions that made working in an auto plant even kind of decent have disappeared. Bloomberg, of all places, actually recently published a heartbreaking expose about young 20-somethings who were working in uh, auto plants in the U.S. South. Uh, and it was, I cried when I read this article, it was really sad. I mean, it told the story of a young woman was impaled trying to fix her uh, machine that she was working on because they all wanted to go home, she died. Um, a young man lost his arm, a younger man fell in a vat of acid. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's happening in the industry now. So the only way to make these jobs better is to force companies and governments to make them better. And this is the question, how do we actually do that? I've never worked in an auto plant, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by telling your workers how to beat their bosses. But I can say this, workers need a strong left that can help them from the outside. It can help by giving up the notion that it's the responsibility of unions only to lead the fight against capitalism. Unions can't be, and this is something that I was talking about yesterday uh, in the panel with Charlie, it's not structurally possible for unions to be responsible for leading the fight against capitalism. They're not in a position to do that. So I think the left can build an independent source. It needs to build an independent source of working class power that unions can both draw from and empower. But that's another discussion. There you go. All right. I think. How do I get this into? Go to slideshow. Slideshow. Slide. Up at the top there. All right. And then from, from beginning. beginning. Ah, okay. Almost. Do it again. All right. Yeah. What and then do just I do? Make it bigger. How do I do that? Uh, again. Uh, this, from, from beginning. From beginning. All right. From beginning. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. This is. A particular sort of, um, this slideshow and presentation is based on some work I did about three, four years ago, which was actually modeled on the method that uh, Nikki used in her dissertation to put together a database on the actual movement of capital in the tire industry. And it's the project has sort of transformed over the years, et cetera, but I want to sort of talk about how we look at some of the dominant explanations for the decline of industrial unionism generally, but particularly in the North American tire industry, and debunk several of them. <laughs> so, oh, wrong. How do I do? Oh, 
Just, no, 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 it's fine. Just don't, don't, yeah, click again. And then oh, you good. Can, yeah. Now you see. Okay. What needs to be explained? Sorry. All right. This is a chart of the unionized capacity in the U.S. and Canadian tire industry from 1969 to 2008. I don't have traditional density numbers because the problem is, is that the rubber, United Rubber Workers Union, which represented the uh, tire workers, represented not only people who produce tires, but all other rubber goods. And then to be able to figure out what percentage. So I, what instead I did is that what many people who do study this industry do is look at the percentage of capacity to produce tires that, was, that is unionized. In 1969-1970, 100% of the tire industry output in the U.S. was unionized. All the passenger car tires, light trucks, big trucks, earth movers, etc. Today, in 2008, it's slightly, it's around 55%. It's probably dropped even further, but I haven't traced it since 2008. So what we need to explain is this massive deunionization of this key industry. Shoot. Sorry. I'll figure it out in a minute. Okay, there you go. All right. Most explanations for union decline generally, and for this industry in particular, fall into the category of what Mike Goldfield in his book, The Decline of Organized Labor in the U.S. called sociological explanations. In other words, that there are some sort of structural changes in the labor force or in capital that explain the decline of unionization. And in the tire industry, and in generally, we have four variants. Globalization, foreign ownership, regionalization, and more recently, we've heard this at this conference, deindustrialization and the growth of a surplus population. Now, globalization, the argument is very simple. The bulk of tire production, supposedly, like most U.S. manufacturing since the late 70s, has, quote, moved offshore. Transnational corporations are footloose and fancy free. They abandon production in the high-wage global north for the low-wage global south. They move at will and move constantly. So here's a statement from the United Steelworkers, who, by the way, swallowed up the rubber workers, along with a number of other unions, in 1995, basically arguing that the reason that they can't get a good deal out of Bridgestone, Fire, Bridgestone, which is the Firestone, which is the big Japanese-owned uh, tire corporation, is because these people are just globalists and they keep moving their plants from one place to another. Uh, Uh, the second argument is that it's foreign ownership. And this is particularly true in the U.S. tire industry. With the exception of Goodyear, foreign transnationals, Michelin, Bridgestone, etc., dominate production of, of tires in, the, in North America. And the argument is these foreign owned firms are more hostile to U.S. unions and U.S. workers than U.S. owned firms. Goodyear, Firestone, BF Goodrich, Uniroyal, et cetera. Uh, here's a, from a journalistic history of the rubber workers where it basically says they're just, you know, they don't care about American workers. They're uh, more concerned with protecting their own workers at home, et cetera, et cetera. The next argument is, well, maybe it hasn't moved offshore, and maybe it's not just the foreigners. It's they've moved to the south. And that the southern political authorities and southern workers are more hostile to unions than northerners, as evidenced by right to work laws and the defeats of the, most of the unions in conventional NLRB elections. Uh, again, Meyer, his journalistic history, talks about, you know, just you can't organize southerners, they're too backward, they're too whatever. Okay? I'm running through this quickly because I don't want to take, I want to leave some time. We've more recently heard the argument that it's the with increasing productivity of labor, et cetera, mechanization, et cetera. The proportion of the industrial employment throughout the world has declined. And this, 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 the growth, deindustrialization and the growth of so-called surplus populations has weakened those with jobs. And here's a good quote from Aaron Beninoff's dis doctoral dissertation where he lays it out very quickly, very clearly. The higher the unemployment, the weaker the 
workers are at the point of production, and then the growing impossibility. Work will become more precarious, more part-time, people will jump from job to job, and thus are unorganizable. Okay. Now, let's start with the globalization argument, which is, <coughs> and basically, borrowing a term from Kim, this is basically global only. Much of what's said about the movement of manufacturing is made up shit. Okay? Since the 1960s, 75% of global investment remains in its country of origin. So when Goodyear opens up tire, invents in a new tire plant, 75% of that funding is going to go to plants that are in the United States. Of the 25% of global investments that's foreign direct investment, 90% flows from one country in the global north to the other. In other words, when Goodyear or GM invest abroad, it's not mostly in Mexico or even Brazil or South Africa or China. It's in Western Europe, the US, Japan. Okay? And if we look at tire investment uh, events in the tire industry, we see that this pretty much coincides. Openings, over, uh, over half of the, the new openings were in the global north. Expansions overwhelmingly in the global north. Closings as well. And downsizings almost exclusively in the global north. Um, I have some very rough data on the amount, the amount of the reported value of investments over that period of almost 40 years. Uh, 50 years, that we see that, in fact, 72% of the investment I could tra trace out from these uh, trade journals that I used to create my database goes to the global north. In other words, the global tire industry is not moving wholesale to the south. They, like all heavy manu all capital-intensive manufacturing, pursue what Nikki just called produce where you sell. And this is very important, by the way, when you're producing things like tires, which when you ship them are 80% air. Uh, somebody in the audience suggested, have they thought about filling them with jelly beans or something when they <laughs> ship them across oceans? They don't ship them that far. Okay? All right. Uh, company investments by region of origin. Again, you see U.S. tire companies are are mostly 58% of the investments is either US or Canada and then 22% is in the global north in the global south the big 6 which i believe were Brazil, Mexico, uh, China, etc make up most of the foreign direct investment. Okay? Uh, tire investment these are events okay. Now what actually was going on in the industry and this is where it happens in North America. And what we see is, in the period from 1966 to 74, and following Anwar Sheikh, I argue that the crisis of profit, the last big crisis of profitability, begins in the mid-60s. Now, from 66 to 74, when we see the global recession, U.S. companies generally respond to it by expanding existing capacity. And you see that in that period, Openings, expansions, weight uh, overwhelmed, um, downsizings, and there were no closings between 66 and 74. Period 75 to 83 is when the rubber hits the, when the shit hits the fan for U.S. manufacturing, including the tire industry, where they realize that they have to restructure. And there's a lot of detail I can talk about of the restructuring and how this involved a shift in both product and technology from bias ply to radial tires, et cetera, at some other point. But what we see then is lots of downsizings, lots of closings, but some expansions, retooling of factories. And then from 84 to 2007, we see a tremendous growth in expansions, openings, still continue some closings through the mid-80s, but you see, again, a renewed expansion of the industry. Okay. Shifting pattern of ownership and unionization. To what extent is non-U.S. ownership of tire production? Of in, so there's three questions. How, to what extent do non-U.S. firms own? To what extent are they more resistant to unionization than U.S. corporations? 
and to which extent do these U.S. corporations favor their own workers over U.S. workers. Now, very quickly, it is very clear that there was a sharp rise in the mid to late 80s. Remember, unionization, unionized capacity is already dropping by the mid to late 70s. You see a sharp rise in foreign ownership of, capa of tire capacity between, really, from eight, the late 80, mid to 80s onward. It jumps up in about two years and has actually slow, fallen just slightly with the recovery, particularly of Goodyear, the only U.S.-owned corporation. Okay? Most of this is that when foreign companies buy out the less competitive, in mergers and acquisitions, competitive tire companies. So Continental, the German company, buys General, which was one of the, the smallest of the big five in the U.S. Pirelli purchased Armstrong, another very small firm, but the big ones were Bridgestone, the big Japanese transnational, buys Firestone, which was the number two firm. Michelin purchased what's is left of BF Goodrich and Uniroyal, which were two and three. And then Yokohama purchases Mohawk, which was another small company. The keys were in 88 and 89, Bridgestone buying Firestone, and then Michelin buying the other two of the big four, BF Goodrich and Uniroyal. So that today, the only US owned tire company is Goodyear. That remains quite competitive, by the way. All right. Were they more resist, are foreign firms more resistant to unionization? There is no evidence that they are more resistant here than at home, etc. So, for example, Michelin was successfully organized in France. Of course, it took a wave of sit-down strikes in the wake of the election of the Popular Front government in 1936 to organize Michelin. And Michelin was one of the most vir virulently anti-union employers in France. Bridgestone, like all the Japanese manufacturers since the defeat of the post-war la labor upsurge, had negotiated with Utila Enterprise Unions. U.S. tire companies were vicious in their anti-union activity. Just as a, not only did they bring out the cops in Akron, not only did they stockpile weapons on a scale similar to that of the auto companies and the steel companies, et cetera, not only did they call out, try to recruit students from the University of Akron to act as strike breakers, et cetera, but two of the biggest owners were open sympathizers of not just the Nazis, but particularly Franco. Harvey Firestone sent money to Franco, as did James O'Neill, who headed up General Tire. These people were not in any way soft and cuddly around the URW. Okay? They don't favor their own workers. And here's just some you know, recent stuff on layoffs, increasing precarity of work in the Japanese industries, etc. So the claim that it's foreigners is a real problem. To what extent is the tire industry restricted to the South, and to what extent is the U.S. South more resistant? Well, it is absolutely true that starting real A, they've always had Southern plants. And you can see that during the war, from 1935 to 45, it quadruples. Remains pretty steady until the 60s, and then we start to see a lot more new plants there. Okay, so. In terms of this is the big five, this is Goodyear, BF Goodrich, Uniroyal, U.S. Rubber, um, General, and Firestone. Okay. We can see, though, that from 66, the most of the expansion is concentrated in the South. And we can see very clearly that by the late 60s, early 70s, the center of gravity of that industry has shifted to the south. They're somewhat different from auto, where, I mean, clearly there's still production in the U.S. Midwest. It goes from slightly over 40% down to about 15%. Uh, but the center of the industry, unlike the auto industry, has shifted to the U.S. South. Now, can the South be organized? Now, the reality is that the URW was particularly effective in organizing Southern industry until 1976. Every time the, the, the tire firms opened up factories in the South, 
and tried to operate them non-union and did all the usual things that they did back through the 50s and 60s and 70s to defeat unions in NLRB elections, the, the rubber workers were very successful. Every new plant was organized within two to three years. Okay? The turning point is 1976, when essentially you start to see this, the after 76, it takes almost forever for there to be successful organizing. It takes 14 years for the rubber workers to organize the Oklahoma City plant that Firestone opens in 69. It takes them eight years to organize the, ten, the Laverne plant, which is outside of uh, Memphis. Okay. Do Southern workers want unions? This is again from, yes, while pro-union sentiment in the South is weaker than it is in the East and Midwest, it, it, the majority of workers approve of unions. If it didn't involve risks like losing what is historically now a shitty job, but looks much better than working at a, K, at a Walmart, then more workers would probably easily vote for unions. The idea that they are so backward, so racist, so rural, etc., that they would never consider joining unions is not, has no basis. 